The Blind Ambition with Jack Kelly is brought to you by Hims. Hims is changing healthcare by providing access to affordable and discreet sexual health treatments. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash blind. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash blind for your personalized ED treatment options. Hymns.com slash blind. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. Rejection is never easy, especially when it comes to the H-1B visa lottery. Fortunately, our friends at Mob Squad have a solution to help you stay in North America, eliminate U.S. work visa issues for good, and continue supporting your current company. Mob Squad can secure work permits and help you and your family move to Canada in just four weeks. Get in touch with Mob Squad to learn more at mobsquad.io slash blindambition. That's mobsquad.io slash blindambition. I'd love to introduce our amazing guest today, Andrea Giuzzuni. I would love for you to just give a little bit of color about what you do currently, and a little backdrop in terms of your experiences and your background and things that you're passionate about doing. With pleasure, Jack. So I'm, I'm, I'm Italian, 54, and I, I, I have a degree in economics, uh, and I started with Ernest & Young, EY now, uh, when I was 25. So it's, it's been a, quite a journey, uh, almost 30 years uh, with the firm. Uh, I started uh, as, a, as a young auditor in a very small office uh, near Modena, where the Ferrari are built. Uh, I, I spent a couple of years in the audit department. I moved to London uh, in the late 90s, uh, and I joined the corporate finance department, uh, doing a lot of sexy stuff, evaluation, due diligence, uh, m and in general. And uh, I, I fell in love with the job, uh, and uh, I really uh, never left it. I have been with, uh, with the firm in this uh, department called uh, Strategy and Transaction for... Uh, the, the last 20 plus years, and I, I served uh, as a consultant, a variety of different clients, private equity, um, corporates, uh, in a variety of different industries, uh, and uh, in a variety of different countries, actually. And in the last um, couple of years, uh, since 2010, I started really acting as a manager for the firm. This is a big firm. Uh, our revenues are in excess of uh, $50 billion. So I now represent one of the four uh, divisions or service lines, as we call it, um, which deals really with uh, strategy, deals, transactions, uh, transformation, and these kind of things. So that must be really exciting for, let's say, with deal flow in terms of mergers and acquisitions, M&A, and then IPOs. Those are kind of sexy parts of the market. How does that work? Are you are you kind of the corporate whisperer talking to these CEOs, advising what to do? How does this go up behind the scenes when there's a yeah. when there's this big transaction going on? We do really uh, bring in front of our clients, private equity corporates, deal ideas, uh, and we really look into their uh, strategies to try to find. Uh, and the right opportunities uh, to grow, really to, to do more with their capital. But we also execute upon deals. So we perform uh, all those uh, technical things that are really relevant to execute upon uh, a complex deal, maybe a cross-border deal involving dozens of different countries. Uh, so we look at uh, the investments uh, from a variety of perspectives. We have specialists who are looking into um, every sort of dimensions, valuation, accounting, tax, uh, legal aspects, commercial aspects, uh, integration, and tech, obviously, IT, integration of systems, rationalization, and then post-deal integration, how we actually create value by merging entities. Or conversely, how we actually create value by allowing our companies to become uh, leaner and meaner, so divestment, spins, and these kind of things. So we do a bit of both. It's really the uh, front-end, strategic whispers, as you, as you define it, uh, but also really we go in depth into the execution, end-to-end, -end, to ensure that uh, what we have whispered actually finds uh, its realization in terms of value creation. Rick, that's pretty cool, right? That, seems like, that sounds like a fun job, no? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of hard work uh, and a lot of different people with different skills working together across the board, uh, different time zones, uh, 
with the same technology, looking into a lot of data facts uh, and making sense of all this. Uh, it's a super multidisciplinary effort, uh, which actually, from an intellectual point of view, it's super stimulating. No. I admittedly don't have that finance background. And so when I hear these terms, I, I get a little intimidated, to be quite candid. You know, how does someone rise through the ranks at EY and get that, you know, capital markets transactions experience? Do you have to, you know, take a crash course? Do you have to have an economics or a business degree to be able to have that foundational knowledge to get into this line of work? It's a very good question, uh, Rick. I, I think uh, all, all of us um, obviously has uh, um, some some very strong background in some of the domains that are relevant uh, for something like that. So, for example, I have a, a, a background in economics, but we have a lot of uh, engineers. We have people uh, coming from uh, from uh, tax background. Uh, and the operations, et cetera. The beauty of these firms is actually that you, during your career, you train and you are exposed to a variety of different competencies and skills. You, you, you need to know really a lot eh, of the things that are relevant, but you tend to be proficient and very vertical in only a few. So you can really participate in a broader discussion with different uh, people at the table, with different perspectives, understanding them all, and also knowing what you don't know, and but enough really to understand that you need uh, the help of other people. Generally, you develop uh, a lot of um, tech expertise. You need really to understand uh, how to harness data and technology. Now we have uh, a lot of uh, AI support for our analysis, which actually um, can bring to life a lot of new insights uh, coupled with uh, our sector expertise, uh, you come up with a lot of uh, new things, new ideas, uh, new opportunities that uh, only five years ago were unthinkable. So that's really the sort of uh, continuous education you have to, to go through when you are in these sort of uh, large firms. And EY, uh, it's a fantastic school in this respect because we are probably the, 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 the most integrated globally firm. I mean, so it's, it's really a, a multicultural experience as well. So you get to know people coming from uh, and different geographies, different cultures. It enriches you also as a human being a lot. Andrea, just to kind of visualize this. So let's say there's an M&A transaction or an IPO transaction that you're advising. Can you kind of set the stage of like what that looks like? Because I imagine in, in my mind, like maybe it's this war room type of situation where everybody is in this big boardroom and you, you know, you're trying to make this IPO go or this deal get done. What's it like? Is this a huge adrenaline rush? Can, can you walk us through how you feel and what people are doing? It's uh, it, it's interesting uh, because generally you have uh, a very slow start in these kind of things. Uh, a lot of these uh, big deals uh, actually are designed uh, behind the scenes for uh, for several months, sometimes years, uh, due to the complexity inherent in this situation uh, takes a lot of uh, undercover work to ensure that when you really kick off uh, the real project, uh, you have enough elements uh, to really consider the likelihood of a successful transaction and you start and then off you go. I mean, obviously you have um, a lot of project management, so it's not particularly sexy. It's hard work. Uh, it's really plumbing over uh, poetry. I mean, you have a lot of data to crunch, a lot of documents uh, actually to prepare, and a lot of analysis to, to ensure that uh, all the different uh, multifaceted elements of a deal are covered uh, from a risk perspective, valuation perspective, so different teams working in parallel on different work streams. And then uh, towards the end of the process, uh, yes, Jack, the adrenaline uh, um, <laughs> goes and uh, because uh, you have uh, actually deadlines, so there are best of presentations and you have all the stakeholders, board presentation, board meetings, and obviously you cannot make mistakes. I mean, every word counts. In today's world, the way in which you actually explain the narrative, the, the, the rationale underlying every transaction makes a huge difference. So it's really quantitative, but it's also qualitative. It takes uh, a lot of uh, 
thinking as to how you present the case to the internal stakeholders and to the external investors. And obviously, uh, you reach the, your, uh, your peak when uh, you go really public and the day comes and uh, the documents are signed. And again, it's uh, incredibly rewarding. Generally, it's uh, the result of months and months of hard work and teamwork. I mean, you can imagine, I mean, not always uh, a smooth uh, path. I mean, there are a lot of issues, uh, things that don't go in the right directions uh, and, uh, and mistakes uh, and, uh, and corrections. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a, I mean, it's a bit of a journey. Every single large project tend to really absorb uh, an incredible amount of energies, both emotional energies and intellectual energies. Two points here. It seems like there's a, a, a kind of a cliche-ish for, let's say, police officers or firefighters, where it's it's lots of downtime. You know, you're doing your work, you know, just, just kind of flatlining a little bit. But then all of a sudden, boom, everything changes really quickly. It flares it's up, awesome. yes. And then, right? And then everybody is on. And speaking of that, what kind of people, let's say, on your team, what do you look for in people who might say, oh, my God, this sounds really cool. I would love to be involved in this space. What kind of backgrounds do you look for? What skills do they need to have that you would say, yes, this person would be great to be on our team? The, the, the people we have on our teams tend to have a lot of in common. First, uh, and foremost is really the, the the intellectual curiosity. They want really to learn, to know more about things, how the world works. And this is really a fundamental aspect because uh, you really need to study a lot. I mean, this is work, but it's it's continuous learning and training and, and looking at uh, different perspectives. The second tribute uh, we look for, and it's obviously you can really understand from what I've just said, is really the ability to work in team. We need people who can accept the different roles uh, in the different situations. Sometimes I lead, uh, other times uh, I'm led because there are people that are more proficient in the specific things. Uh, so it's really this uh, ability to be uh, team players and leaders when it's necessary that uh, tend to characterize uh, our professionals. Uh, and again, it's... Uh, it's the human factor that counts. There's a third element, which is really um, being extremely hard worker. So, I mean, you can see the pace of these projects, etc. It tends to require a lot of personal commitment, uh, um, which needs to be justified by the satisfaction you feel doing these kind of things. So compared to the 80s, 90s, uh, where actually um, those working in, uh, in this line of business, uh, I mean, in particular investment banking, uh, in, in transaction in general, I think we used to work really crazy hours. Now the environment has changed significantly, but it remains a very demanding uh, occupation that with uh, all the possibility to work uh, from home. I mean, uh, we have some relief, obviously, because you have uh, the possibility to travel less, to commute less. Nevertheless, travels uh, and the possibility to spend uh, valuable time, uh, in physical meetings, uh, meaning the logistics can be complicated. Uh, it's it's demanding for our professionals. So it's, it's not a job that uh, is for everyone, also in terms of uh, work-life balance. Uh, sometimes it's uh, it's harder than other, than other professions. I want to dive into something that you mentioned, that the work isn't just done when the IPO or the acquisition or the merger happens. You mentioned post-deal integrations and how you still continue to advise these boards and executives after the so-called event happens. Can you walk us through that? Because, you know, you mentioned that you bring in engineers to help with the technology, adopting new systems. Are, are, are you just in the middle and putting people together and bringing folks together? You know, how does that part of the equation work out after the event? It's a super important part of the equation, Rick, and this is what really clients uh, uh, want more and more because, uh, I mean, trying really to design a deal and, uh, and only being responsible for the execution of the transaction element of this, uh, that was really more in the 80s and 90s. Uh, I think over the last <laughs> couple of years, uh, and I think legitimately so, I mean, our clients really want to ensure that uh, the initial design can actually be translated into effective execution. And the value that we envisage at the beginning uh, can actually be transformed into actual return 
for the investors so value creation in technical terms more and more uh, we are asked and we are actually are uh, equipped to uh, talk about uh, a potential deal uh, from the very outset, uh, looking into the operationalization of the post-deal uh, environment. Uh, and you can only do this if you uh, have at the table uh, the actual people who will be in charge uh, of the post-deal uh, value realization, uh, because they will commit to delivering, to help our clients deliver that value. And they will also uh, advise regarding uh, all the specific aspects that need to be dealt with uh, ahead of the deal to ensure that we maximize the likelihood of getting the most out of a transaction, which per se are very expensive things. You can imagine uh, the amount of time that the, the, the management has to spend really to get these things right very strategic, a huge amount of capital, so a huge amount of time dedicated to this. And then the, the, the actual cost related to the transaction, bankers, lawyers, consultants, and so on and so forth. So you need really to get the value you have in mind and delivered at a certain point. So when the deal actually is executed and the transaction is completed, the, the real life starts uh, because you have really to ensure that all the assumptions you made, uh, all the plans uh, you had uh, can actually be executed. So the more realistic, the more grounded uh, these plans were, and the, the, the higher the likelihood that actually the value can be realized within the timeline expected for this. And again, the human factor prevails. Uh, you need to have the right people uh, with the right knowledge uh, of the different cultures, especially when you merge two businesses, uh, the cultural aspects become of fundamental importance. But you need to have people very, very vertical in specific fields. Uh, you mentioned uh, IT, and I mean, you need to, to have people who understand very well how to connect different environments uh, and do this uh, in a very uh, safe manner. I mean, today, cybersecurity and these kind of things of paramount importance uh, and the confidentiality, it's, it's key, especially if you are uh, talking about uh, listed companies uh, where actually stock prices can be affected uh, by leakages, etc. So all these aspects become incredibly important also in the post-deal situation. And these projects uh, can take uh, actually several years uh, to, to be analyzed. It's, it's a long-term stuff because you need really to reorganize uh, business lines, uh, move uh, companies. And sometimes you need really to um, change quite completely the business processes uh, that, that were present in the target company because they need to be realigned more effectively to the, the acquirer's one. So it's super complex, uh, but that's really... The, the most uh, value adding part of the equation because uh, just buying uh, an asset, uh, I mean, may, may be <laughs> sexy for uh, for certain investor yeah. who can uh, actually speculate uh, on uh, on on the, the swings in share prices uh, and uh, the week before or the week afterwards. But the, the real point uh, is really the value that you create over time by by really merging these two different entities uh, and and building something that. Uh, and should uh, attract a much higher value in the long term. This episode of The Blind Ambition with Jack Kelly is brought to you by BetterHelp. For anyone out there who needs to hear this, you are more than your job. Don't get us wrong. Passion for your work is great, but it's so important to find joy, fulfillment, and validation in your life as a whole, not just at work. And therapy can help you get there. We all go through ups and downs in our career. Maybe you're thinking about switching career paths or you're feeling super burned out in your job. You might be struggling with the uncertainty of our current economy or trying to manage the anxiety that can come up during the job interview process. Whatever it is, you're not alone and therapy can help. Therapy gives you a place to talk through what's going on at work in a safe and supportive environment, figure out what goals you have for your life and career, and build the confidence to go out and make them happen. Otherwise, it's easy to stick at the same old, even if it's not making you happy. If you're interested in giving therapy a try, BetterHelp offers affordable online therapy on a flexible week-to-week -week schedule so you can fit it into your day. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get started, then BetterHelp will match you with a licensed therapist based on your needs, preferences, and goals. Connect with your therapist by text, phone, or video call. Start the process in minutes and switch therapists anytime. Elevate your work and your life with BetterHelp. 
Visit BetterHelp.com slash Team Blind for 20% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash T-E-A-M-B-L-I-N-D for 20% off your first month. Now, I, I wonder, beyond the you know actual financial events of the transaction, what other you know things do CEOs bring you in on to uh, kind of consult and advise in terms of how they can succeed as a business? We, we look into all the strategic aspects of a business. Our, our scope is, uh, is super broad. I mean, what we, we, we do in, in the most strategic part of our offering is really how we reimagine uh, businesses, reimagine how we actually um, start from the existing assets and we reimagining a, a, a business, uh, looking at the technology that is available, uh, looking at the different uh, setup of the existing processes, uh, and giving really the the, the possibility for uh, for our clients uh, to monetize uh, on assets that currently are uh, are standing idle and and really reaching a much broader customer base both uh, geographically and uh, in terms of uh, um, different categories of, of customers and and structuring value from um, from products uh, and that uh, are probably undersold today so this that's part uh, of the of the transformation journey is probably um, probably even more interesting than the m a one in many respects and uh, generally they tend to go hand in hand actually and it's really how we transform uh, a traditional analog business uh, into something that uh, can reach its full potential by exploiting uh, the advancement in technology and its cloud, uh, its AI, its blockchain, it's all these um, these additional things uh, uh, that coupled with uh, the ingenuity and creativity of the human beings can actually give rise to a huge amount of value that can be unleashed. And actually, our um, corporate world uh, is still in the middle of this journey. I mean, some enterprises uh, have already started this journey. A few have almost completed this, uh, but uh, the vast majority are still in the middle. So there's a huge uh, uh, runway for uh, for our economies to become more productive, more efficient, uh, and actually more work for us as consulting, trying really to disseminate the knowledge that we accumulate as we we advise uh, companies in different sectors. You mentioned AI. Where, where do you see it fitting in within your practice and and just E and Y in general? Is this something that you're you know, adopting really quickly and making life easier when you're doing, you know, an MA deal or an IPO or any other financial traction transactions, or or you're kind of just feeling it out to see what's what's really going to go on. I think it's 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 very interesting the fact that uh, this technology, despite the fact that uh, has been around for uh, decades, probably has matured over the last uh, let's say 24 months um, incredibly fast. There has been really breakthroughs. Uh, and these uh, advancements uh, have led to an incredibly fast adoption. So there are a lot of uh, use cases now available uh, that are mainly focused uh, on uh, what we call the, the efficiency play. So how we do the same things that we used to do without that technology, faster, with more quality, with uh, uh, less labor. And these use cases actually are quite uh, uh, useful across the board, uh, every industry, every profession. Obviously, the more you work in a, let's say, intellectual field where you need really a lot of data and you need really to um, use a lot of information and analysis, in particular qualitative stuff, this technology is a no-brainer and uh, the rate of adoption is super fast. So for us, having the possibility really to use this technology to scan the web and all the databases to understand what kind of uh, new targets could be suitable uh, for uh, a client of ours or really to produce uh, an entire insights report uh, in, uh, in five minutes instead of uh, five weeks uh, and getting really reports uh, and, uh, and, and other documents, proposals prepared 80% uh, ready in, uh, in a couple of minutes. I mean, this is a game changer for us as it is for, uh, for our customers. What is coming uh, as the, the, the technology um, further improves uh, is really the, the, the passage from uh, an efficiency 
play to uh, value creation, top line, and and ultimately the 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 the, the final stage. Uh, we can see, we can really predict this uh, technology becoming a competitive advantage in terms of transforming the business processes and transforming really the businesses. Uh, still to come, I think that we 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 need another couple of breakthroughs probably to get there. But the potential is there. That's why it's so ranked so high in uh, in the corporate agenda that because they, they, they actually the businesses who can get uh, there first, uh, they can re really gain a competitive advantage uh, well beyond uh, the efficiencies uh, that are currently um, on top of everybody's agenda. For our industry, for the professional service industry, this is going to change quite significantly the shape of our workforce. We need probably more people uh, making sense of what uh, uh, this technology can generate for us uh, and probably less people. Uh, bored to death in some uh, very mundane uh, <laughs> exercises uh, that have always uh, characterized uh, the investment banking and the professional service industry. It's going to be an evolution also the way in which we train our people, the way in which we, we use our people uh, to make the most uh, out of this technology. It's very, very uh, exciting, I would say, for everybody. Now, Andrea, you have more than 20 years of experience in transactions. Now, over those 20 years, there's been so many different, you know, you mentioned technology trends, industry trends, but there's also been different business cycles and economic conditions. How has transactions, these M&A deals, these IPOs, um, these investments by these corporates, how have they changed over that time? The process that leads to the execution of uh, of deals and transactions in general has not really changed massively. Obviously, uh, there has been a lot of improvements, in particular when uh, we, we moved from, uh, for example, uh, physical data rooms with uh, hundreds uh, of files uh, and, and now virtual data rooms, and now we have AI really <laughs> scanning through all these documents. So that's changed. But at the end, uh, it's uh, it's uh, an intellectual exercise aimed at uh, assessing all the aspects uh, of a potential target, uh, even beforehand, at assessing all the potential targets uh, that can create value um, uh, if combined uh, with the acquirer. So I think that conceptually has not really changed much. The way in which the individual stages of the process uh, um, are conducted uh, actually have changed a lot, uh, especially after the, the pandemic, much less uh, travels uh, and, uh, and logistics much more simplified by all these uh, virtual uh, possibilities and the use of uh, video calls, etc. Cons, uh, I think that um, one of the uh, most important um, aspects of this job is really to have the possibility to meet physically with incredibly interesting people, managers, CEOs, and uh, other uh, professionals, uh, and really establish uh, relationships, uh, working together, spending time together, and, and building a network of different people with different cultures. But the, the rationale uh, around these, these transactions uh, remains the same. I mean, it's uh, the, a deal uh, is the fastest way really to transform a business. You can do this very fast by buying instead of building. Building is much more complicated, less risky sometimes, but much more complicated. So it's the best way to boost growth, uh, to boost innovation. I think PAOs and boards accept the risk uh, of doing these uh, these massive investments because uh, it's uh, it's a game changer, and uh, that's really the beauty of this. I mean, uh, a lot at stake, but at the same time, a huge reward uh, if executed properly. Now, are there moments that you find that IPO transactions, these deals, tick up? You you mentioned that the need for these businesses, these executives, these boards to realize game-changing impact or increase their scope, those are certainly catalysts. But are there any other kind of pivotal moments that, you know, either lead to an uptick or even a decrease in this kind of activity? In the in, in the current environment, CEOs are actually looking at increasingly at investments and spins as a way of creating value. Large corporates uh, with a very diversified scope uh, and sometimes with uh, subsidiaries and operations in countries, in geographies, uh, or operating in sectors, uh, 
that uh, may become problematic in the long term due to all the changes we discussed before, geopolitical things, changing customer taste, technology aspects. There's a, this sort of willingness to do what we call the portfolio review. So really open up uh, all your assets, all your businesses, all your subsidiaries, all your revenue streams, and try to understand whether there's a better way to use the capital you have currently deployed. Generally, this means that, uh, um, yes, you would like to invest more in certain specific geographies or sectors or products. But in order to do so, you need to simplify the model. You need to divest actually in other parts of the business because uh, the scenarios change or is going to change fast. So the investments are becoming more and more at the top of the CEO's agenda because also capital is quite expensive today, especially more, more expense, expensive than it used to be until two years ago. So I think the possibility to fund the new ventures uh, those who actually are going to give rise to uh, the future revenue streams by disposing of businesses that are not uh, doing um, particularly bad, but uh, they could be better in somebody else's hands, uh, where probably the, their core business uh, is more aligned with uh, with these um, service lines, these divisions. That's becoming uh, a paramount importance for uh, for boards and investors and investor asking actually boards to look much more actively at these aspects as a way really to free up capital and redeploy it in a in a more effective manner so the 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 the, the bigger the corporation the more sophisticated the, the business model and the more likely that the they go through this sort of processes as a natural ongoing exercise to ensure that uh, the capital they are using is uh, is getting the highest possible return. So you will see that uh, there is a trend over the last couple of years, and not just for, for tax reason. I think there are also fiscal implications uh, that um, may, may trigger some of these uh, spins. But uh, in general, it's really the sheer consideration that uh, a slimmer, uh, a thinner organization can actually create more value for the shareholders uh, than the conglomerate. It's a phenomenon that uh, tends to repeat uh, over time because uh, you tend to build uh, certain constructs, certain frameworks, certain organizations based uh, on uh, the foreseeable future and the existing uh, circumstances. And then, uh, especially in, uh, in the last couple of years, things change so quickly that all of a sudden you find that your footprint is not the, the best one to face the uncertainty of the future or the few certainties we have about the future. So you need really to, um, to pivot to something different. And again, if the acquisition is a very complicated exercise, it's more an art than a science in many respects, the investments are not easier because you have to take... Uh, a look at all the consideration regarding the separations, the, 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 the transition period, the trended asset, uh, transitional agreements. Uh, so the complexities regarding uh, a spin, uh, a divestment, uh, tend to be probably even bigger than an acquisition. And actually, the value that you can destroy if you can, don't do this right uh, can be immense. In particular, you look at the, the disruption that you can cause to the division you, you decide to spin off uh, and, uh, and all the obviously uh, social and, uh, and and human factors that can be somehow associated with this sort of separations. Uh, so pulling together different cultures is complicated, but separating people uh, who actually belong to the same uh, team, the same firm, the same culture is not an easy task. I really appreciate this advice and this walkthrough into what from an outsider's perspective seems to be quite complex and and, and, and difficult, very dynamic situation. So thank you, Andrea, for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That's it for The Blind Ambition. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star rating and a review. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.